Hello and welcome to another Heartstark Radio program. Today, our guest is Maggie Segrich. She is the founder of Sesh Coworking. In just a moment, she's going to be with us to share her story. I'm Carol Murphy, your host, and Daniel Hogan is in the studio. And as always, remember that you can email us at heartstockradio at gmail.com. We'd just love to hear from our listeners or folks who would like to be on the show. In just a moment, we'll be back with Maggie and learn all about Sesh Coworking. This is Heartstock. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw the Thanks for tuning in and listening here at Heartstock Radio. Today, we have Maggie Segrich, and she is the founder of Sesh Coworking. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you so much for being on Heartstock. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> well, it's kind of spring, but kind of winter here in Montana, as usual, about this time of the year. So I think, generally speaking, I can say we're all tired of snow. But how are things there? You're located in Houston? Yes, we are. So spring usually gets started here in Houston, end of February, beginning of March. So our daily highs right now are about at 85 degrees. Oh, perfect. Perfect yeah, weather. I- I agree. (laughs) So can you share for our listeners just a brief introduction as to what is SESH Coworking? Yeah. So SESH Coworking actually began with my co-founder in 2017. She started with a meetup group called Girl SESH, and she was hosting meetups about once a month throughout Houston in local coffee shops, uh, restaurants, art galleries, and gathering women who needed community, who desired resources from other business owners, and who just kind of wanted to work alongside other people. Um, She had been doing that for about a year when I moved to Houston in the middle of 2018 from New York. And I found her hosting these meetups and started attending them. And because I had built a chamber of commerce in New York and I had my jewelry company at the time, I was looking for a space and a community to kind of reestablish myself in Houston. And she kept talking about this brick and mortar. And the more she kept talking about it, the more I wanted it, the more I wanted it for other people to gather with and work together. So I asked if I could help her and she was like, oh, that's cute. (laughs) I was like, no, but really I want to help you. So at the end of 2018, we became business partners. We spent the majority of 2019 looking for a space for our community. We found it at the end of 2019 and opened our first brick and mortar February 3rd of 2020, we were Houston's first female-centered co-working space, and we were open for all of six weeks prior to the shutdown, and we reopened in June, and we kind of reopened with a new audience that we wanted to target because as we watched what was going on politically and socially across the world, we understood that what we as women experience in the workplace is not an individual silo, that it is, it is experienced by the LGBT community and the BIPOC community on a much more frequent and larger scale. So we pivoted and now we are not only female-centered, but we are a safe and inclusive workspace and community for all. So we managed to survive 2020 and 2021 
and came out the other end of it growing so much so that we needed a larger location. Uh, we reopened in January of this year, in 2022, to a space of about 20,000 square feet. So we've been working these last four months to finish up the construction and continue growing our community here in Houston. So I'm wondering, the first question that comes to mind is, um, were you always from New York? And what was the draw in Houston? I personally, I've been to New York, but not Houston. I've heard fantastic things about Houston, though. Yeah, so I am originally from the Midwest. My parents were divorced when I was one. And one lived kind of inner city St. Louis, and one lived on a 500-acre farm in Illinois. After college, I moved out to the West Coast, lived there for about 18 months, met my husband, and he got a job in New York. And so we moved to New York, right smack in the middle of the recession. (laughs) I got a job in Wall Street, and we spent 10 years in New York. I realized very soon after one winter in New York that I was not happy with winter. (laughs) Uh, I made him promise me that if we ever got the opportunity to move to a warmer climate, we would. And lo and behold, 10 years later, he got another job. And not only did they have an office in New York City, but they had an office in Houston. So we spent time traveling back and forth between the two. We would get Airbnbs here in Houston in kind of all the different neighborhoods, testing out the different neighborhoods, see what we liked, what we didn't like, what fit kind of the lifestyle we were going for. And uh, we found our neighborhood, the the Heights here in Houston, which kind of reminds us a little bit of our time in Brooklyn, a little bit more walkable, kind of quirky buildings, a lot of small businesses and restaurants and um, beer gardens and outdoor patios. So, I mean, we fell in love and we made the jump and I'm so glad we did because I don't know how we would have made it through the pandemic had we not been in Houston and had the ability to, you know, have a backyard and a pool and enjoy those things um, while we were all staying at home. So I'm wondering, as many of our guests, you have a very diverse background. I'm wondering what your educational experiences were and where those took place and how they, those might have influenced where you are now. Yeah, so it's funny, you know, hindsight's everything, right? I finished my high school time in that small town in Illinois called Pittsfield. And I had gone into my senior year thinking I was going to study art and go to school, get an art degree. And the more I talked about it, the more kind of the reaction from my peers and or older folks in my life was kind of, well, what are you going to do with that? you know and I was like oh I guess I guess they have a point and I listened so I decided to go to school get got my English degree the idea was to be a high school English teacher I was a double major in secondary education and English and by the time I hit the end of my junior year I was like yeah no this this isn't what I want um so I just finished out with my English degree When I moved to the West Coast and then to New York with my husband, like I said previously, I got a job in finance. I was the editor at a small bank. We were in the Chrysler building. I edited the research reports. I did all the travel bookings for the research department and kind of did admin stuff as well. And I kind of realized very quickly, "Hmm, these aren't my people. (laughs) How did you know that? (laughs) <laughs> well, I knew it because I didn't have anything in common with them. I was the only woman for quite some time in the department, and I kind of felt trapped, I guess. I was going to work in the dark, and I was coming home in the dark because I was working such long hours, and I just wasn't feeling fulfilled. So I started taking classes at FIT, one of them happened to be a jewelry class. And and just for our listeners, FIT, 
Who? is the Fashion Institute of Technology <laughs> yes. in New York City. <laughs> a, a wonderful place. It, it's, yeah. <laughs> it is. If, you, if you're ever in Manhattan, I highly recommend going and checking out their museum. They always have wonderful exhibits. And I kind of fell in love. I got to be creative. I was getting a good response. People wanted to buy my jewelry. So I applied to the jewelry program and I got in. And so I quit my job, went back to school, got my jewelry design degree. And I did that for the next 10 years. And it wasn't until I moved to Houston and had kind of that experience in building a chamber that I was like, I think I found my thing. And I think my thing is building community and providing a space for people to hold space and for people to grow and develop themselves and their ideas. Because what I realized is I didn't ever have that space, whether that was because I was a woman or because I grew up in the Midwest and in the Midwest, it's kind of a different lifestyle than it is when you go to a larger city on any of the coasts. Um, so it's kind of how I came to be at Sesh. And I can imagine there was quite a cultural shift going from your experiences there in New York. I mean, especially Wall Street, for heaven's sakes, going to Houston. What was that like for you? Oh, man. You know, one of the first times I realized how different it was is when I was at the grocery store. And... In New York, you you walk everywhere, right? You, you, you walk from your apartment to the train, you get off the train, and you walk to work. And it's like the moment the doors of your house opens or your apartment or your work or even the subway, it, it's a very fast-paced stream of people, and you just have to, like, go. And if you can't keep up with the stream of people, they're literally going to bump into you. And so I was at the grocery store here in Houston, and I was just keeping up with my fast pace from New York. And I was like, I think I'm running through the grocery store. I was like, I should slow down. <laughs> and then I got to the cashier, and the cashier asked me how I was doing and uh, where I lived. And then someone held the door open for me. And I was like, why are these people talking to me? Why are they being so friendly? And then it just kept happening. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in Houston. <laughs> it's not New York. Like in New York, people are so hyper focused on their career and their life. In Houston, it's just, it's a little bit slower. And people put family first here. Not that they don't in New York, but like in order to have a family in New York, you have to have a good job to support that family and live that lifestyle. So it was a very welcomed change of pace. And honestly, Houston reminds me of my upbringing as a child, living, you know, and going to the school in St. Louis and then spending my holidays and my weekends on the farm in Illinois with my mom. Because I feel like it's like a good mix of both. Mm. And lots of changes happening in Houston, I hear from some of my friends. As Is it Tesla that's moving in? I believe they're going to Austin. Oh, which is okay. Got about it. Three hours away. Okay. I have uh, my Houston and Austin confused. Yeah. So as far as the community there goes, we're going to delve into that here more deeply. But I think this is a good place to take our midway point break. And in just a moment, we will be back with Maggie and talk more deeply about SESH co-working. This is Heart Stuck. We'll be right back.
This is Heartstock Radio, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Just want to say thanks so much for tuning in and listening here. Today, our guest is Maggie Segrich, and she is the co-founder of Sesh Coworking. And Maggie, I really wanted to talk a little bit about your experiences there, kind of moving and, and being a new resident in Houston and finding your your co-founder. Can you share a little bit about your early experiences and how you guys decided and determined what your mission was going to be? Yeah, I think Meredith and I both can very easily say that we feel very lucky and blessed to have found each other and to have developed a partnership over these last few years, because as our partnership and relationship essentially has strengthened, so has our SESH community. I think a lot of times when you find a partner, the idea of what your business is and who's going to do what seems like very clear. And I think for Meredith and I, it wasn't super clear in the beginning, right? Because we're both very creative. We both have a passion for community. And so a little bit of the beginning of our foundation as partners was deciding, okay, well, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? And then how can we fill in the gap for each other? And if we can't fill in the gap... Who can we go talk to and ask questions and learn how to better serve our community? And I think because we did spend a year looking for the space, I think because we did go through the pandemic together, we went through a maternity leave, Meredith got pregnant, and we had to figure that out. I don't know if anyone or any of your listeners are familiar with the freeze that happened here in Texas last year. Basically, the entire state of Texas froze over, which is a big deal because we don't have the infrastructure and our homes are not built to deal with temperatures below 30 degrees for about a week. It was 10 to 14 degrees here. So the power went out, all the water pipes froze and then burst in everyone's homes the grocery stores were empty. Um, it was very shocking and a lot of people lost their homes. And having to work through all of those things together as partners, but also with our community members and be like, oh my gosh, you've been displaced. Please come come work at SESH. That's the one thing that we can help you do. We can't fix your house, but we can provide you a place to work. And I think just really having to learn how to problem solve and problem solve on a very fast moving timeline because a lot has happened in the last two years. I think that helped us develop the relationship and not only with ourselves, but with our community and our business. And I I just think it makes us better people and better business owners. And how were you able to find funding for your venture? So Meredith and I ultimately ended up bootstrapping which means we funded it ourselves because banks will not give you loans unless you have three years of cash flow. Then kind of goes with the SBA and getting um, SBA loans. The other thing with the SBA is that co-working is still technically a new niche business and people don't really understand it. Sometimes there's not even codes for whether you're going to do an EIDL loan or a PPP or an SBA or you're going to the bank and they want to file your taxes or look at your tax returns. There's codes that they need to input information on and they just don't exist because that's how new co-working is. And so we've struggled a lot trying to get outside financing, but we've mostly bootstrapped. Last fall, we did a round of crowdfunding and asked our community to donate to the new space that we're building in Midtown in Houston. That's how we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. And please share a little bit about what you do there in the way of supporting your diverse community. Are there 
events that you host or do people come and use the space and host their own events? Just share a little bit about that experience for the folks who use the the co-working space. Yeah, it's both and then even more. So not only are we a co-working space, so you can come here and work in the open areas. You can come here, you can work in an office. You can come in and work in a conference room. We have a dedicated event space. So really our members, as well as people who are not our members, can access the space and use it. So they can have their own webinars in our conference room. They can have their own one-year anniversary parties in our event space. They can host a lunch and learn. And then on top of that, SESH does host its own events, whether they're business or personal development, networking. Sometimes we even do DIY stuff like neon signs or tastings. We've done chocolate tastings, wine tastings, honey and cheese. We really try to curate our events to fit the kind of tastes and lifestyles of the members who are using our space. But then outside of that, the other thing that SESH also does to help support our diverse community is that we provide scholarships for nonprofits to use our space complimentary. And we seek out nonprofits who are making an impact for the underserved minority communities. So we provide them, if they need a conference room, we provide that for them. We provide them a dedicated desk. It's their desk and only their desk or space to host their own events. We also have worked with several local colleges and programs in terms of providing internships so students can get hands-on experience in being a startup and what it's like to run a small business because it's a lot different than just going to a mid-sized or large corporation and punching in and working from nine to five. Um, Indeedy. And I'm wondering, we have, oh, about four minutes left. What does the future hold for you? What are you envisioning and planning for the future? Well, we definitely would like to finish construction downstairs. <laughs> we've, we've been delayed through whether that's the permitting process or supply chain stuff. So that's something we definitely have in our future, hopefully come midsummer. Mm-hmm. And then it's to fill that space. And then I think from there, Meredith and I would like to open up other locations, whether that's a second location here in Houston or another city in Texas. And then from there, we would like to start opening locations in other underserved communities throughout the United States. So we do have long-term goals to provide SESH co-working to people across the United States. And what's the bottom line here? What's the impact that you're hoping will take place by, you know, targeting what you see as your customer base at this point or where you can have maybe the most impact? Yeah, I think our mission is to not only provide a safe and inclusive workspace for people, but to also provide a workspace that allows people to acknowledge that it's okay to work different. I think the pandemic kind of sped up that timeline and really opened up people's eyes and was a silver lining for SESH, right? Because it showed people how much, let's say, parents or people who have primary care relationships, whether that's a parent or sibling that they have to care for, how much work goes into that outside of their actual job. And to have a community who can provide resources to help that or resources to help you start your new business and leave your nine to five is going to lower the barrier to entry for a lot of our community because a lot of what we've experienced so far 
has been offered to a particular portion of the population and we're trying to offer it to everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering also, you mentioned before that you're you're serving women in particular. What have you learned about women's needs, particularly related to co-working or you just work, work in general that's guided you on this path? You know, what what are some of the specific needs that women have that uh, are not getting met? Yeah, I think Meredith and I can oftentimes speak to that. Um, from our own experiences as working women, but also as working mothers. Uh, Between the two of us, we have four little girls. And I think for us, it's one, it's, it's setting a good example for our girls, right? Showing them that we can achieve our dreams and that we can do it and make time for them at the same time. And then I think the other side of that is that women tend to work a little bit differently. We wear a lot of hats as women. We're caregivers, we're nurturers, we're dedicated. And I think sometimes when you show up to work, you're not just showing up to work as the worker bee who's got to get these, I got to get these reports filled in and I got to get get that finished and I got to do that conference call, you show up as like, oh my gosh, my dog at home is really sick and I can't take off of work to be at a vet. So what, like, what's my option? You know, and I think allowing people to have the space to address the many facets that they have in their selves, I think will just ultimately build a better workforce. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that idea of support. And how might folks find you? Gosh, you can find us in a number of ways, whether that's LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, Do you have like a a website or if, say, there's other folks out there who are working in the co-working space that might have some questions or need assistance (laughs) yeah you can go to your favorite search engine and look us up and we have a contact us button on there our phone numbers listed on there i believe we even have a contact page where you can send us your inquiries whether that's Mm -hmm. for day passes for co-working or just other general resources Fantastic. And thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for being on Heartstock and sharing your story. I'm Once again, I'm very inspired. Thank you. Thank you. This is Heartstock. We shall be back next week. Take care until then. Peace. This land was with you and me As I went Hardstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5 Butte America Radio. Hear our programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing.